Hello humans, I'm Polos, the host of Cannabatic Podcast, and today we sit down with Anthony from Clean Peace Toronto, who started a glass cleaning business during the midst of pandemic. We discussed the challenges he faced, how he got his first clients, how to clean glass, and why going for something is more important than letting the scamdemic hold you back. So please tune in, subscribe, like, share, and catch you on the other side. Record, and I think it is cool. It shows recording. Me recording. Bam. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for coming on, uh, Anthony. Uh, not only it's an honor to have the first diabetic on the Cannabetic podcast, but mm-hmm. when I found out your about your business, I think it's like one of the most unique businesses that I've seen. And um, we'll talk about it a little bit more, but it's like one of those businesses that you and your buddies talk about, hey, why don't we uh, get a bone cleaning services? And you actually went through and executed on it. So I just want to talk a little bit about how you got started. I saw an about me section, you came from a wine background. And uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Cool. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, so my background, I spent 10 years in the wine making industry. Um, my passion was always with cannabis. And kind of while it was illegal, I didn't really see a career path other than just kind of, you know, selling illegal weed and it's good money, but um, I didn't really see where that would lead. So I kind of did the wine thing for a long time. And then in 2018, when weed was legalized in Canada, I was like, let me see if I can get my way into this industry. So I'd had an education and background in restaurant management. Mm-hmm. So I went to my friend who was managing. So we have, uh, I, I think you have them down there too, but we have like cannabis lounges here in Toronto where you can go and you can smoke and uh, go to comedy shows. And it's kind of like a bar just for weed. You bring your own weed to it. So my buddy was managing kind of Canada's oldest one and most famous. It's called Vapor Central. And I said, hey, look, I'm looking to transition to cannabis. And he kind of just gave me a job right on the spot. So I started working in this lounge. And before that, I've always owned glass. And I've always been really passionate about keeping it super clean. But then when I got to this lounge, I'd be cleaning anywhere from 30 to 40 bongs a day, right? And we'd need them done quickly. So you're kind of working like in a dishwashing position, especially when you're the first hire, you're doing a lot of bong cleaning. (laughs) So did that for about a year. Uh, A whole bunch of stuff happened. I ended up becoming the manager of the lounge. Um, So yeah, uh, I, I was always cleaning bongs and I always thought to bring you know, the bong cleaning, try to make it a bigger element of the lounge. But as I interviewed customers and stuff, they all said, you know, I don't want to bring a dirty bong with me on the subway, bring it downtown, get it washed, bring it home. Right. And they all said they wanted it picked up. Fast forward to COVID uh, in Ontario here, we had a lockdown for five months starting in March um, where my lounge was forced to be closed. Permanently? And I was Well, no, like, I mean, the lockdown, I think you guys are seeing some of that happening in California and stuff. So it was like, uh, they shut down all the bars and restaurants. Mm, Um, Retail was cut down to essentials only. Um, And kind of, I had this dream job that now I couldn't work at. And I was sitting at home for three months and just getting more and more in my own head and just getting more and more depressed. And there was so much going on in the outside world both down in the States and here in Canada. And I'm kind of just like, and being a diabetic, right? I was super afraid for the first few months because they kept saying 5% of the world's diabetics are going to die. Like, you know, if you have diabetes, you have to be scared. And I'm a young person with type one, but they didn't make any differentiation about which type of diabetes, what exactly will happen to you. So for those first three months, I was terrified. I was just living in my room, smoking way too much weed, And it got to this point where there was one day where I was like, I was just ready to give up. And I was like, you know, I got to do something. So I I put out on Instagram, I said, Hey, does anybody want their bong cleaned? And within the first hour, I got six messages back. And I was like, huh, maybe I'm onto something here. Um, So I just started putting out more messages and it just started picking up and picking up. And as it picked up, I studied more about cleaning glass and 
and uh, laboratory equipment, how to clean that and make it sparkling like new and um, kind of one thing led to another and now uh, I'm doing bong cleaning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, so you basically validated your MVP through Insta DMs just by posting a status, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, right away, so many people came out of the woodwork saying, oh, this is such a great. And it was funny because people who don't understand cannabis, who aren't part of this lifestyle, this culture, looked at me like I had three heads. You know, they were <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Like, you have a degree, two college diplomas. 10 years of experience in management and you're going to wash bongs and um, everybody in the cannabis side was like, finally, you know, like well, finally somebody doing something entrepreneur. Like there were a lot of people who just supported me just because it seemed like the world was ending and I was out there really just trying to push positivity and just like, and just the entrepreneurial spirit, right? Like there's still so much opportunity out there if you could just see it and just take a risk, right? Luckily, what I'm doing really had very little capital to, uh, you know, get started. But I think there's going to be, a, with legalization, there's going to be a ton of opportunities like this. Like, and with legalization, there's always gaps in the market. So there's just going to be things that are available and then things that aren't available. So like uh, one thing that we're looking, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but one thing we're looking to expanding into is like rosin pressing. And that people's house anyway, everybody's grown their own weed this year in Canada. And if you want to make concentrates out of it, there's really no way for you to do that at home unless you put $800 into a machine or if not more. Right. So I'm just trying to think of all the gaps that exist in the legal market right now and uh, attack them. How did um, I looked at your about me and you worked in the wine industry and you talked about what it takes to get um, the bottles clean. Uh, is there like a specific process or method that you guys follow in order to ensure that the bottle is clean and like you said, uh, safer consumption in wine? Yeah. Yeah. So like, it's actually funny. My first job ever was working in a winemaking shop and, uh, the first task or chore I had to do was I had to clean 32 large, uh, we call them carboys where you make the wine inside mm -hmm. and, uh, is the process was a bit easier with the wine because the wine residue, first of all, you're cleaning it right after you use it. Uh, whereas with people's bongs, they tend to let it build up for months and it's a sticky resin. But we would just use like a heavy sanitizer and uh, clean them out. And with wine, because it's like a fermentation process, yep. it's super important that it's done in a hyper sterile environment. Um, so that's where I got, that's where I developed kind of my attention to detail when cleaning glass, because it may just be almost invisible to the eye. But if you see a little speck, that could be a million cells of bacteria or whatever, right? And just making sure that things are sparkling clean. So that it was funny when I came over to the, to the weed side, and I was doing the bong cleaning. I noticed right away customers would come up to me and be like, hey, I want you to clean my bong because I just had this different level of attention to detail I, I guess in like you know the y combinator stuff they call it that wow factor or whatever yep. like just want to amaze your customers and that was kind of always my focus and uh, it seems to be paying off um i want to talk about uh what's it called though how did you start off with the services when you've or how did you i guess move after you uh validated the mvp having the first few bongs clean like what were your steps after what a what, uh, I guess, what was your strategy after? What do you thought that how you're going to expand and stuff? Okay. So first I was using my traditional method, which I had learned from years of doing it and a bit from in the, the lounge, mm -hmm. hot water, rubbing alcohol, shake, break your arms off. Right. I was, because I'd done so many before I was already much more efficient at it, but I re I'll never forget. Like I did, I did about 20 bongs before I got one that I was like, what is wrong with this person? You know, like, just like there was like an inch of resin on the outside of the bong. And I remember I charged that guy 20 bucks and it took me like three hours 
Because I have this ridiculous attention to detail too, right? And I just remember after the first half an hour, I try to get everything done in a half an hour. That's kind of where my costs, that's the way I calculated. But after the first half hour, I was like, okay, this is, I got to get better at this. And then after the first hour, I was like ready to give up. And I was like, <laughs> I need to, I need to figure out how to do this more efficiently and quickly than I was already doing it. Um, so that's when I started to really research like cleaning laboratory equipment. Um, that's when I started to, so I have an ultrasonic cleaner. That's where I kind of developed that idea. And I really started to learn about cleaning solutions heavily, like what they do, the difference between like a solvent based cleaning solution and one that's solventless. Um, and it just became all about this efficiency, this efficiency, um, which I think I, I, I developed. I can do even the grimiest bong in 15 minutes now. Mm -hmm. um, so the next step of this kind of efficiency thing is, is more on the delivery side. I was really focused on getting a cargo van and like fitting it up and like doing all the cleanings like right on the spot. Mm -hmm. The amount of legal red tape I ran into was just like a nightmare. It was, I, I, was, I couldn't. I wanted to ask you about that. Would, is that, how do you register a business like that in Canada? Because is it still you're dealing with paraphernalia or? It's is crazy. It just, is it just you just glass? mention the, no, it's if you just mention the word cannabis, you're automatically adding 100,000 X stress to your life. It's so right now I'm incorporated, but I can't open a bank account to buy the shares in the corporation. So I have this corporation just sitting out in the, so just issues I've run into, uh, opening a bank account because I'm a cannabis business, Yep. Uh, getting business insurance, auto insurance, buying the car itself. Uh, there were issues around the fact that it was a cargo van and that needs to be a commercial vehicle. Uh, and then that tied in with the cannabis. It was just every, every step of me trying to take this legit was a headache and has been a headache and continues to be a headache um, where, you know, I'm doing just fine. I'm doing just fine with this Instagram DMs and just people sliding in and adding one customer at a time. But, you know, you want to do any of these things that you would traditionally do in a business to kind of improve your reach. I can't promote anywhere. My Facebook account has been banned from doing promotion. And I tried every single type of wording. I didn't include cannabis. Uh, I've since realized, I've since learned that you apparently if you're a cannabis business on Facebook or Instagram, don't ever use the word deliver. Um, I think that's what kind of got me screwed. Uh, but yeah, just headache at every single turn insurance banking um yeah um i want to talk about so there's obviously two ends to the business the front end and the back end um i want to talk about first how did you develop i guess the price pricing for cleaning and then the services was it just at first you know regular bond cleaning so you had some sort of material the cost of getting the bond clean the time or you've actually asked the consumers or the users uh what would you be paying for a clean bong or you based it off the previous experience that when you worked at the um, uh, Vapor Central? I definitely didn't base it off the previous experience. We were only charging $2 for bong cleans there. What the I hell? Don't know. <laughs> yes, I know. That was, that was something that was uh, decided before my time and something that I tried to work on changing for a long time. But what I learned at Vapor Central is, uh, is I guess you call it play, price elasticity or whatever. Um, it seems that cannabis users are very, uh, I don't want to use the word stingy. They're very, uh, they get accustomed to their price. And we're seeing the same issue in the legal market here where like kind of people are like, well, this is what I've always paid and I won't pay another dollar more. And they don't like, uh... so yeah, I did not use the Vapor Central pricing. <laughs> yeah, would have been out of business. So, to be honest, it was a bit arbitrary. I just sort of said, I said anywhere from 10 to $20 sounds like something I would pay. Mm -hmm. And then I set that price. It is a work in progress and I'm trying mm -hmm. to 
uh, and the prices will probably come up. Uh, I did set the prices during that lockdown, so the roads were completely empty. I was making it to I was making it to pickups and drop offs in fifteen minutes for things that would now. It's not even like our roads are busy again yet, but it takes about an hour. Mm-hmm. So, so that that that's got to be uh, factored in, and then. And I've learned over time sort of how much time certain things will take me. Mm-hmm. People are giving me really complex pieces as well, right? Like, mm-hmm. uh, which I, I had kind of factored before, but I just figured I was just going to be cleaning regular bongs for people. But I guess when people see this service is available and they have like a five per <laughs> bong, they're like, they're like, I hate cleaning that thing. Let me just give it to this guy, right? Um, and I've had to kind of learn that if the thing's super complex, I need to, uh, but it's not, it's not a cost-based pricing. It's more just value-based. I think, um, my costs are super low. My costs are very, very low. Is there any Um, competitors out there or you're kind of like the only one that's doing this? In Toronto, not that I know of. There's, um, so before I came up with, I, I didn't know this before I started to do research, but there was a guy out in British Columbia, out in BC, out West, uh, doing this beforehand. But he's doing this like in his like parents' basement, very like simple, like hot water rubbing alcohol sort of the situation. Mm-hmm. There's a guy in Denver doing this, and he seems to be the one kind of doing it on the, at least probably put the most money into it. They're called Pipe Dreams. Mm-hmm. Um, the guy in San Francisco and I'm seeing them popping up all over the place now. Like I'm getting added on, on Instagram by like a new account every week uh, in different parts of America, different parts of Canada. Um, It's a great side hustle. Like it's like, I've been telling people since the beginning, like, I mean, I have probably more experience than anybody else. uh, And I like to think I have a a over uh, overactive drive, but this is not something you can't do at home. You can't do yourself for, for a few extra bucks, right? Um, it's a simple process and there's people out there who just aren't willing to do it. Um, yeah. I don't remember what the question was. <laughs> uh, um, I was going to go into like the first iteration of, I guess, the first bongs that you cleaned. Uh, what did you learn, I guess, from the first uh, batch of people, meaning uh, the logistics side of things, what chemicals to use, what you need in the future to be sustainable? Mm-hmm. Um, so one of the first things I learned really uh, quickly that I hadn't had any experience with before. First of all, I never really used tobacco with my bong. Mm-hmm. So in Canada, I don't know if it's the same down there, but in Canada, people do this things called poppers. Well, they'll put like it's tobacco and then you sprinkle a little weed on top. Yeah. Give yeah. you a crazy head rush. Right. And it's very popular here. Um, and because I'd never smoked tobacco in my bongs and because at the lounge we were only using weed, uh, I hadn't had a lot of experience cleaning tobacco bongs and tobacco does leave a distinct stain that can't be removed with the same cleaners that cannabis can. Um, so for the first couple bongs there, I would ask people if they used tobacco. I charged them an extra five bucks to clean it with the tobacco, but I didn't even know how to get it cleaner, right? So that was, uh, it took about two weeks of just trying different products, doing research, trying different products. And then I found one that is super eco-friendly, super cheap and easy to use, uh, which gets all the tobacco stains. Stuff. So I would say like that was really the first because those tobacco stains, like you can tell the piece is clean, mm-hmm. but it doesn't look new. Oh, right? yeah. And like, I really pride myself on like bringing people their piece back. And, and, and the funny thing is they'll often bring people their piece back and it looks so new that you spot the, the actual imperfections or whatever, like the, the real staining more so than you had when it was dirty, right? So people be like, oh, I didn't notice that little scratch in there. And it's like, yes, because it kind of got filled up with resin and kind of just became invisible, right? I cleaned a guy's piece the other day. And uh, as soon as I was done it, like you could see like uh, there was bloom in the piece, which is like an imperfection in the glass. 
And it was just kind of funny because it wasn't visible before that, but the piece was just so sparkling clean that you could actually see like any of the, yeah, mistakes um, in the glass. I want to talk about a little bit about the vapes too. Did you start off with cleaning vapes right away or you added that as the services kind of progressed? I had it right away. It's not a popular, it, it's not um, the most popular uh, service I provide. I think most vapes are designed to be able to clean them pretty, pretty quickly and pretty easily. Um, but I did do a hell of a lot of research into how to clean electronic parts. And, uh, and I'm proud to say that I could even clean cell phones with my ultrasonic cleaner now. Uh, I know how to put electronic elements into the cleaning solution and they come out working just like new. Um, but yeah, I, I, the vape thing, it seems that people are pretty comfortable cleaning their own. Yeah. Um, can you expand a little bit on the ultra, the ultrasonic cleaner? What is that? And how did you, I guess, find that out? Hmm. I don't remember where I, I think I would have first learned about the ultrasonic stuff when I really started doing my preliminary like lab cleaning research. Um, so the way an ultrasonic machine works is it sends small vibrations through liquid, uh, whether that's a cleaning solution or just water or whatever. Um, it's kind of like a stainless steel bowl. And then there's a little speaker on the bottom of it that vibrates the water. And those little vibrations do the cleaning for you. So it's a non-abrasive way of cleaning. I don't need to use any brushes. I need to use any salt, um, which may not seem like a big deal if you're, if you're using, um, you know, 20 to 300 dollar piece but i've cleaned pieces for people that were upwards of five thousand um, dollars and there's a big resale market for that heady glass and uh any type of abrasive is can be risky right you don't want and like i said when you get it super clean you start to notice all those little imperfections right um so you might not realize that putting that brush into your down stem every time is actually damaging it. But then when you get one of these deep cleans, you can just see all of these lines and scratches on the glass. The glass is actually quite delicate. I mean, it's glass, right? Um, yeah. The ultrasonic is amazing. It's a, it's a definite, uh, once you want, the ultrasonic does a great job, but it's really the cleaning solution that kicks it into overdrive. Um, the machine will get all the, it'll get the dirt off, but you really need a good cleaning solution that uh, they're called surfacants in, in whatever cleaning terminology. And that's what like actually lifts it off the glass and takes it out into the solution. Um, I'm really happy with the cleaning stuff we have. And I've seen, like I said, there's a few of these places popping up and everybody kind of figures out the ultrasonic thing within a month or two. Um, it appears to me that the cleaning stuff I'm using is doing the best job. Uh, not to say that the other guys aren't doing a, a great job, but I don't know if it's just my attention to detail, but I, I never send a piece back that looks even remotely dirty. Like it's got to look brand spanking new and uh, yeah. Um, I was looking through your process, which kind of caught my eye, the rinse, steam, clean, shine. And uh, I read every single process deionized water uh where did you get that is it was that discovered through your research about cleaning or you've previously used in wine business or no no that was discovered through the lab stuff and that's the way that's how you clean electronic parts so deionized water has all the ions removed so it's like ultra pure pure water and what a lot of people don't realize the reason electronics short out when you put them into water is because the water actually has all these small minerals in it mm -hmm. and when the water evaporates those minerals stay on your electronic parts and interfere with them right so this uh deionized water you can actually throw your and i tried this you could throw your cell phone into it vibrate it and it'll take all the little like specks of stuff outside out from inside the phone um it's bizarre to watch, like just putting a phone in and out of water and it, it stays on and nothing happens to it. But um, yeah, the, the deionized water, 
I'm, I'm, I'm only using it now for the final rinse. Because mm. another cool thing about it is, is because it's lacking these ions, water wants to have ions in it. So it actually pulls, it, it tries to kind of pull everything from around it. So like if you were to drink the ionized water, it would actually start to pull the calcium out of your teeth and your mouth would start to hurt. It's actually quite unhealthy to drink this stuff because it just pulls minerals from everything around it. So I use it for the last, I was using it initially for everything, but it is a bit expensive to make. It's not super expensive, but just to try to keep costs low. I think I really only need it for that final rinse. And then what the best things about it is it ensures that what I can like, I can use a hair dryer on the piece. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, is if you're washing with tap water and you use like a hair dryer, you try to dry something quickly, it'll, you'll often see stains show up right away because the hard water staining, like the minerals in the water will just be left behind when the water evaporates. Um, the nice thing about this is like, I can get a piece cleaned and dried up in 15 minutes flat and just hand it back. And there's not going to be any stains left in it. Um, yeah, the deionized water is pretty sweet. It's actually what they use at car washes. If you've ever wondered how they managed to get all that soap off your car with just like one blast of pressurized water. Like, I don't know if you've ever tried to take soap off anything, but it usually doesn't come off with one rinse, right? So yeah. that's actually how they, it helps grab the soap off and doesn't leave any streaking as well. Um, the second thing I saw, the steam jet technology, uh, what is that? Can you explain that? Is it something that DIY you built or you can pre-order those? I saw something uh, dental and medical offices have those, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, it, the one I'm using is not that advanced. Really, the advantage of the steam is you're just, you're, you're adding heat and liquid to, it's sort of to get the, the bong primed. Mm -hmm. Um You'd be getting the same thing from running boiling water through it, but it's just much faster to just get steam on command than to actually wait for a kettle to boil. Mm -hmm. And then I, I find it a bit safer and easier to just use the wand that just has hot water coming out of it. Um, that was kind of the mentality behind that. The, the, steam, the steam cleaning is also really nice for more small, like the bowl piece when it, it it's often a bit difficult to get the little ring in between where the bowl and the bottom connects. There's like this kind of like ring right where the hole is. That can be a bit difficult to clean out sometimes with the steam. You just blast it out. Um, but again, it's just more to replace uh, replace the uh, the need for boiling a kettle and just that. Yeah. Um, and then this, uh, like one of the last things, uh, detergent, I, th I saw you're using a bio, uh, what's the word? It's, it's all like a eco-friendly, uh, did you come up with that solution yourself or you found somebody that sells something similar? Uh, do you make it on your own or? Luckily for me, while I was in the, the hunt for a solution, which I already had a really good one. This, this, there's a guy, he's a grower in uh, just a bit north of where I am. And he hit me up and he's like, look, I've come out with this new, um, initially he, he created it to clean growing equipment, like your trimmer and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and he's it like, does it get works sticky really well too. on glass. Yeah. And he's like, it works really well on glass. It's hyper concentrated. So you can just dilute it down. And he gave me a bottle and he's like, give it a try. See how it works out. I was not expecting it to be as good as it is. And I, I don't really know what's in it. I'm almost hesitant to ask because it's so good. I suspect like, it's just, it's just a few surface, like with all cleaning detergents, they're usually just some sort of acid uh, and then a surfactant in it that just lifts it off the glass. And, um, and this site's called Res Beak Gone. It's not cheap. It's really intended for kind of more high, high volume growers, but, um, it's, it's a great product. It's just amazing. I, I, uh, so that's what I'm going with. I get it for free because I promote him and, uh, and I think the product is just amazing. Um, what's the difference between, you know, I think everybody used, uh, the 420 cleaners, um, uh, what is it called? The Randy's when it has a whole bunch of salts, the problem with those, uh, it leaves, a weird smell after like a detergent. And if you're using the bong, sure. sometimes you couldn't even taste it when you inhale it. Uh, so what's mm -hmm. the difference between, I guess, 
uh, your process, what you're doing, obviously with the steam cleaning and somebody that just goes under hot water with, you know, 420 cleaner. Yeah. So all of those ones that you usually get on all of the ones you get on the shelf, those are all solvent based. Mm -hmm. And I would say 99.9% of them are just using ISO. So like when you're getting Randy's, especially Orange Chronic, any of those products, they're just giving you rubbing alcohol and salt prepackaged. Uh, mm. Sometimes they'll add a little bit of citrus, like the Orange Chronic adds a little bit of citrus. But um, the way those work is that's the solvent-based cleaning. So all it's doing is just basically sticking to the whatever the resin in your bong and it just be, they become one right problem iso is not terrible for the environment but the thing is is when you're adding a solvent to it so you're adding this resin and then you're you like the, the way you're supposed to use iso is you're supposed to lay it flat on something and then it evaporates off into the into the ethos, whatever. <laughs> when you're using a high concentration of it and then it's binding to these resins and then you're just pouring it down the sink, it doesn't get an opportunity to evaporate. And it actually is con cancer causing. And, uh, and I mean, I, I don't wanna like go out there and pretend like I'm saving the environment by not using solvent based things, but on a big scale, like, it's not good for the environment to be just throwing rubbing alcohol down the sink all the time in, in large amounts. Right. Yeah. Um, so there's that. That's the nice thing about ours. Ours just acts in a way that it lifts it off and then it carries it out. It doesn't actually stick to it. So it's not like kind of staying. And then again, it's all biodegradable, totally healthy. I saw the guy who gives it to me took a sip of it. I mean, I wouldn't do that. I'm sure he had some runny shits after or something, but um, yeah. Um, That's a movie scene. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, can you walk us through your day? So uh, walk us through every single step. Uh, somebody DMs you or how can they book online part perhaps right now? What do you do yep. exactly? Um, send a message back. Do you obviously your service is sort of like uber like right the same day cleaning or mm -hmm. or do mm -hmm. you have like a scheduled book for the rest of the week it depends on them uh it, it it seems most people are this seems to be a bit of an i have a lot of repeat customers but it's sort of an impulse thing mm -hmm. like if i don't get to them in the first few hours like i won't hear from them again for another month mm -hmm. um so the dms has been like i have I'm paying money to have scheduling software on my website. You could book on Facebook. Um, but it just seems people sliding in the DMs and just saying, hey, I got this dirty piece, sending over a photo, I send a quote, and then I'm usually there in a few hours and get it back in a few hours. Um, so normally my day is just like waking up to uh, a few DMs, figuring out where people are at, planning the route, and then, uh, yeah going out and making it happen on average i really would like for yeah. the i would really like for the scheduling stuff to work out better and i'm trying to figure out how to optimize that for some reason instagram had me like i, I know the word isn't shadow ban but there, there was something funny going on with my account where i couldn't put my website up i couldn't make any edits to the account i i kind of thought it was nearing like getting deleted but mm -hmm. Today, just this morning, uh, it's all that seems to have resolved itself. So my website, well, I'll actually be able to put my website on the, on the page, which should helpfully, uh, you know, drive more people to the scheduling software. Because it'd be nice to be able to, like, know what I'm going to do the next day. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, the job market's scarce right now, and uh, my lounge is closed. So, like, I I'm willing to take business <laughs> however it will come. But How many uh, average orders do you usually get, and do you work uh, seven days a week? Seven days a week? Uh, I'm averaging about four or five a day right now. Mm -hmm. Four or five customers. Um, I would say that probably a quarter of customers usually have multiple pieces to deal with as well. Um, but one thing I'm proud of is I think it's pretty much every day I'm having a repeat customer now. So I've been mm. at this for three months and like, 
the way I kind of see it in my head is hopefully my lounge opens up sooner than later. I could go back to that because that's really where my heart is. Like I want to see cannabis tourism expanded across Canada. Uh, not that bong cleaning isn't, isn't awesome and, and uh, great to me, but um, I would love that I had like five regulars. It's like kind of like first Monday of the month, I'm going to this, 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 and this guy's house. And then I could go into work and it's just sort of like I could build up that. If I could have five customers that I, I every day that I know are going to kind of come back every month and I'm working on a subscription thing. I put one out there, but um, it didn't really take off. Try to figure out a way to, yeah, kind of build up that repeat. Because mm-hmm. um, like I said, it seems to be this a bit of an impulse thing. And I, and I feel bad when I can't like serve somebody right away. And then I don't hear from them or they kind of get caught up with their busy life. Um, I think it'd be good for both me and the customer if they kind of knew, oh, okay, it's, it's Tuesday coming up. Uh, I mean, Anthony's going to be coming by to clean the bong for me. Um, yeah. That'd be nice. Tuesday bong cleaners at my house. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm really trying to push for more head shops to uh, start promoting me in the dispensaries and stuff. Um, I've had success with a few of those, but um, I, I don't know why. Uh, I guess, I mean, I do understand to a certain extent, but it seems like a lot of these head shop owners and the dispensary owners, they're like, well, I sell Orange Chronic. Why would I promote your business? And it's, they don't realize that there are people out there who it doesn't matter if you gave them the best cleaning solution in the world. They're never going to do it. First yep. of all, there's kids who whose parents get mad if the sink smells right? There's people who think it's gross. There's people who are just too lazy. Like there's all these people out there who would, and then I try to tell them like, look, you see that $600 10 arm perk, this and that on your shelf. Nobody in their right mind is going to buy that unless they know they're going to be able to get it cleaned up easily. Like there's a lot of bongs for sale out there that like just are almost impossible to clean if you haven't had experience doing something similar or just the raw drive to to get it clean um so that's been a bit of a challenge but i think that uh if i could kind of go especially with the dispensaries i think there are a lot of people it's like every friday they go to the dispensary and they pick up right like if i could just create this every friday they go to the dispensary pick up and like you know get their bong cleaned they'd be enjoying the cannabis they're buying every Friday, just a little bit more too. I'm not sure. Yeah. Have you asked uh, or have you interviewed uh, your clients um, in terms of like the decision-making process? Is it something when they pick up the bong, Hey, this shit's dirty. Uh, Maybe since they know you now, we could call Anthony to get it cleaned out. Or is it something that they plan ahead? Seems to be on the spot on the spot and you feel uh, like that's the drop off if it's on the spot, if it's not delivered fast and there's just kind of like effort. If it's not picked up fast, it seems most people are pretty chill about getting it back, but they want to like, they want to pick it up today within a few hours or else I don't hear from them again. Even if I like, even if I hit them up a few days later, Hey, you know, uh, sorry, we couldn't meet up. Um, is a uh, do you want you know I'm available for the next few days? Do you, uh, uh, it's like oh I'm busy I'm doing this I'm doing that. And you and you hundred percent everything is done through Instagram, right? No, well, I'd still do. Uh, it's small. I would say ten percent is happening through the scheduling and the website. It's mostly through Instagram. Um, and then Google is. Google is hit or miss. It seems like some days I do really well on Google and then some, and then for like a week at a time, I won't get anything from Google. I get quite a few calls from Google. Keep in mind, like a lot of them are like late night calls. Hey, are you selling weed? And it's like, no, sorry. I don't know how to make that clear, clearer on my website, but um, yeah, I think the top thing I'm, I think the top search term I'm successful with on Google is dispensaries near me which I'm not, uh, not opposed to, right? It is a novel idea and people might not even know this exists, but just trying to get to the top of how to clean bongs would be ideal. 
What are the next steps in terms of your business? Like I know you've been, uh, you just started three months ago. So there's obviously a lot of iterations that happen in the way and sometimes a pivot and, you know, uh, struggles and challenges come. Uh, where are you looking? Like, what are you looking to do next in like three, six months to a year period? Is it something that you want to grow and maybe get other people or sort of, um, what is it called? I don't want to say multi-level marketing. I hate that. Contracts, franchise, franchise whatever, sort yeah, of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even franchise sounds wrong. Some, some yeah, contracts, know, does. like independent contractors. I think that's that's the word. Yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how. I, I would like for it to expand, but to be honest, all the headaches I've ran into in the last three months, I'm going to wait for, I think I was trying to force it to grow. Mm. Like incorporating it might have not been the best idea right away. And like in Canada, you don't have to pay income tax till you do 30,000, right? And it was like, my first month was really successful. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to do 30,000 this year. I better register this. And, reg-. <laughs> and I'm just going to let it grow. I don't really feel pressure on a competition side Mm -hmm. it's such a new idea man it's it's i I don't know how i know i can make an income off the i just don't know how big it can go without having a brick and mortar Mm -hmm. i think the way that's and that's the biggest challenge right if you want brick and mortar or even having like you talked about like a car Canada kind of is people don't really necessarily want to travel with their bong, but I think that brick and mortar is the best way to solve. Like I'm still not opposed to the van idea, but I went through so much heartache trying to get that van. Like there were three times I spent about $5,000 to like just putting down payments, doing this, doing that, getting this incorporation. Like it was like, there were so many times where it's like, I'm going to go get my van on Tuesday. And then I get called on the Monday and it's like, Oh, sorry, we ran into this. This was an issue. This was an issue. And it was like, I think all that trying to force it to get bigger kind of took away from like, when I first started it, when people were telling me I was crazy, I would just tell them, look, man, the world is ending and I'm just a guy trying to figure out how to be happy. And this makes me happy. And if I can make a little bit of money on the side, um, and that's when it made me the happiest when I was just like, I didn't even tell people it was a business, you know, like I was very hesitant for the first little while there to even call it a business. I still call it my side hustle because I think that once I start to put those expectations onto it, mm-hmm. um, at least for my own mental health, I start to like set these like, oh, you haven't grown by this much right and it's like the first month i was doing really well on google and then it's like the next month i'm not and it's like i don't really want to be bogged down by any of that it it seems to be paying me enough just doing what i'm doing and if and like i said if i could just get to that spot where it's like i'm five people a day they know me i'm anthony i'm their guy who cleans their bong like i'm i'm okay with that Mm -hmm. i don't think that this needs to go global and i and then to be honest like i said before i think this is something anybody can do yeah and i and i don't have a big enough ego to say like i'm gonna be the best at this and i'm gonna like have the biggest i think eventually this will be like bong like laundry mats right and Mm -hmm. it'll be like or maybe in the future the way i see expansion is is because i have this background in the hospitality stuff once these lounges start opening up, I wouldn't mind going into a consulting style role or developing like a specific ultrasonic that's designed for as like the dish pit of these, these lounges. Mm. Right. But hiring people, I'd, I'd honestly rather just somebody gives me like, I don't know, 500 bucks and I teach them how to, to do, do it. it. Yeah. I just want to see other people be entrepreneurial too. Like, I, like I said, when I started this, like there's still so much opportunity out there and I just see so many people like just so down on their luck. And because I come from this restaurant background, like so many of my friends are out of work and they're like, they're like, Oh, well, what am I going to do now? This and that's like, man, look, I'm making money cleaning bongs. Like there's so many people out there who are willing to just give you 20 bucks to take a chore off their hands. And if you can figure out what that chore is that you don't mind doing, um, 
And if you put like a little bit of extra effort into it, you're going to wow them and they're going to come back. Right. And, uh, yeah, I, I don't want employees in this, this bone cleaning thing. Plus I also offer like a full insurance for mm. the pieces I clean. Uh, and I've never met anybody who's more careful with glass than I am. Like my staff, when I had the lounge, it was like, it was like they, it was like their part-time job breaking glass. Like it was insane how much glass these people would break. And it's like, and I get it when you're shaking down 30 bongs a day, they don't become individual pieces of art anymore. Right. It's just like, how many of these can I finish? Right. But I, until I started this thing, I'd never broken a bong before. And I only broke one during this, uh, during this experience and I blame the bong like it was a shitty soft glass like it was just a shit bong and I was so mad that it broke because I was like because the bong was probably cheaper than what I was charging for it but whatever um did you replace it (laughs) yes I did I replace everything fully uh luckily for me um my lounge is also owned by like sort of the biggest head shop in in Toronto so Mm -hmm. I have a very close connection to glass and uh can replace things at a pretty uh, affordable rate for me. But again, I've done some really, really, and I've had to tell some people, no, Um, somebody brought me a $15,000 rig and I was like, dude, I'm not touching this. Like, I don't know why, what, like, I think he was just trying to flex like how expensive his rig was, but it was like the first thing he told me was the price. And I was like, yeah, no, thanks. I find like sometimes I'll end up cleaning a piece and then I'll give it back to the guy and he's like, wow, man, this is like when I first bought it. It's like, oh, how much was it? It was like 3,500 bucks. It's like, I kind of wish I knew that beforehand. <laughs> like, and I have to be back. Like I've got, the funny thing is on my website, I've got this long form that you fill out. How many perks? What size? Have you used tobacco, right? And it, it, it covers all these questions. But when people slide in my DMs, like knowing that urgency thing is a thing, I'm usually just like, send me a photo and this is what it'll cost and that can be there then right and i often end up forgetting all those like little things that i guess the professional side of things um yeah um what are some of the biggest challenges that you're facing right now besides you know what covid affects businesses but in general as a startup where do you think you could improve or i guess what's the challenge that kind of reoccurs almost every time like cannabis is legal in Canada. Yeah. I I am not understanding what this headache is that, and I'm barely a cannabis company. Like uh, a big part of me just wants me to turn my website into a jewelry cleaning company. And like sort of, if you know, you know, sort of thing. Right. Because like, I just, I can't believe it. Like my Facebook account has been completely blocked from promoting anything ever again for all time, because I said I would come to your house and clean your bong. You know, Google, uh, every time I try to put up an ad, it's got to go through this review process. And it's so arbitrary. It's some half the time I can put up the same ad twice and half the time I get accepted, half the time it won't. I just, yeah, that if if in the next three to five years, um, I don't know what they're called. Are they called media companies, these social media companies that have everybody's attention, but get to choose what you can promote? Like if they just kind of got a better sense and I'm not saying like you should be able to go out there and say, Hey, come buy this weed, smoke this weed. It's this strong. Right. But like, there's a lot of like ancillary products. Like what if you're a company selling packaging, like for cannabis, like why is your product being blocked? Like it's, it's, and you're promote like, yeah, I could see anything change would be on that end. And then I think the banking stuff will resolve itself over the next year or two. That the social media stuff, I, I don't know when, because the banking stuff is Canadian, right? The social yeah, media yeah. stuff is because you guys have your federal laws, even though like what, like 80% of states have legalized on a state level, like, but. Um, so like you were talking about, yeah, constraints when it comes to uh, financials. Uh, most of the companies are at dispensaries here that do have um, not ATMs, but um, payment processing system for your cards. Mm-hmm. They told me, I asked them, I'm like, how did you, how the heck did you get it in here? And they're like, oh, we just registered it as a boutique store. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is, which is like nonsense. And also means that if the payment processing company gets clued into it at any point, they could just pull. I had, account, I had my right? clients, uh, they had 
big funds frozen from, I'm not even going to say the company because it's not worth uh, promoting it, but it's a very popular yeah. one. Uh, and they got their funds and I'm talking big funds that you can use to grow a company. It's, it, you know, pay your employees suspended with no answer for anything for 60 days. So imagine oh, somebody taking six figures of your bank account and just not replying. Isn't that sort of like mafioso type of stuff? Yeah. That's, that's completely ridiculous. So I definitely understand yeah. from both sides, Canadian, American, you know, these businesses are thriving, even hemp businesses, the ones that got their payment processing shut down or money suspended or on hold. I mean, you don't understand that these are services that provide, you know, livelihood to people. They have employees. Uh, what if what if you are in the middle of growing your company, right? Or if you're in the middle of investing in some sort of marketing campaign or even hiring a new employee and then boom, they just shut it off and then you're like, oh shit, yeah. what do I do now? You can't go to a bank, get a loan or anything anymore. So it's, yeah. or anytime Admin soon. It's still illegal down there. So you could probably expect that to continue, right? Mm -hmm. The thing that just boggles the mind up here is like they legalized it. Yeah. You know? And I've, I've called three different banks. And of course, COVID is complicating everything. You can't just walk into a bank and talk to anybody anymore. Yeah. You have to schedule an appointment with a business advisor. They have to spend 15 minutes telling you why they can't help you. Right. Like I've just gotten to the point where I'm hanging up on people right away as soon as because it's always the same story. Person on the phone is more than willing to help you and wants to sell you the product and get their commission. Then there's always like you'll spend 20, 30 minutes on the phone with people. They'll tell you what an interesting idea you have. We've never heard of that before. But let me just go check one thing. It's always let me go check one thing. They're gone for five minutes. They come back. I'm sorry. We can't, we can't provide you an account. We can't provide you this. We can't do this. We can't do that. It's always the same story. So I've gotten to the point where it's like, as soon as they come back and they're like, I'm sorry, we can't, I hang up the phone right away. Okay. Bye. Right. Cause it's like, you just wasted so much of my time to tell me that I can't do something that's legal. It's like, it part of me is like, why don't I just sell weed? Like, honestly, <laughs> Like I'll have less trouble. Like I swear to God, it's, it's crazy. Um, and, and that's really frustrating. Like, why are they trying to kill people's entrepreneurial spirit? Like you're just trying to like do something different. Um, yeah. Like I, I don't really take a lot of credit card payment processing, so I'm not too worried on that. end. I, I do mostly like e-transfer and uh, cash. Um, but yep, it's always in the back of my head. Like when I know square, I'm using square right now. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys have that down there. But, we do. We do. That's what I was going to uh, say. That's the company that kind of, yeah. yeah, well, that's, I was just going to say, and luckily I'm not doing any six figure transactions or anything. Right. But I know one day I'm going to just have $30 not show up in my account and it's, they're going to be like, Hey, we've, we caught on to you. Right. And I'm gonna have to go find some bullshit credit union. Um, that's going to charge me a way too high percentage. Um, it's just been everything, man. Like just simple business liability insurance, like 30 to 50% higher. And it's like, I'm not doing anything risky. <laughs> it's like, yeah. But, you're just dealing with quote unquote paraphernalia products and you're not, yeah. you're not selling anything. The one, not... one thing I've done that, uh, I'm still debating if I'm going to go through with it fully mm -hmm. is I have found a way to insure the pieces um, through the Lords of London and uh, in the UK. Uh -huh. So like to actually provide um, some sort of like, I have a separate account right now that I'm storing some money in, in case I do break one of these headier pieces. But um, I would like to be able to clean somebody's $15,000 piece. I just can't risk yeah and on my end too right so like if i could go pay an insurance company for a six hour policy to cover this one piece the same way that like when a mover or a construction company is moving a hundred thousand piece dollar piece of marble from the truck into the kitchen right they insure it for that for that space of time uh i'm working on that and i think i'm i think i'm pretty much there but again it'll be something that i offered just to higher end clients really high yeah i don't want to call them high-end clients because they 
sometimes they're like the grossest dudes <laughs> in the world. <laughs> but they definitely have the highest end pieces. Um, yeah. yeah, it just seems like that's about all they spend their money on. But yeah, so you this is the amazement. This... So that's so funny. Guys will like guys will come out like of like a basement apartment smelling like they haven't showered in like eight months and they have like a six thousand dollar piece on them it's like what oh. Believe me, <laughs> i used to go to my buddy's house money, yeah i used to go to my buddy's house and walk in their room and i'm like dude it's been a week like this you can't clean your laundry and mm. your bong is super clean <laughs> you know yeah, it's, yeah 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 right it, yeah. it's ridiculous That's me to a degree but like yeah <laughs> So um, look, can you can you explain like the insurance, right? It's from the UK. Is it a niche company that insures this type of stuff or is it just? The Lords of London is a market, actually. It's a mm. risk. Uh, I'm probably not going to say it right. You might have some finance guys who watch and uh, say this guy's a fucking idiot, but um, it's a market for risk. So let's say you are... Uh, back when I worked in wine, there was a really high profile reviewer taster. He has his nose insured for a million bucks, right? You've, you've probably heard that famous story. There's there's a porn star out there who has his junk insured oh, for a million yeah, bucks, yeah. right? You're not getting that done through an insurance company. You have to kind of put that out on a mark. And the way this market works, from my understanding, is you put a contract out there and you say, I need this insured for this price and this level of coverage, right? Mm -hmm. And then there is a buyer who also works in i guess actuarial sciences or whatever and calculates his risk and then we'll buy that contract sort of thing so i mean it's not like you're going through a company but you're like putting uh you're putting your risk out there and saying who will buy my risk sort of thing. oh so they're kind that's of like my, um, that's my under brokers almost right or something of risk yeah it's 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 from my understanding it's a market like it's mm. just like the new york stock exchange but just for risk um mind you i might be completely off on that but that's my most basic understanding of it and my insurance guy was looking for a lot like he i think he hit up every company he possibly could trying to see if we could figure out a way to make this work but he's like yeah we got to go through lords and you do end up paying up the wazoo like mm -hmm. uh, it would be it, it's not it's not cheap and that's why i say it'll really only be for like you know, you're trying to get your $12,000 piece clean for resale. This is what you're using. This isn't going to be something that you come hit me up and it's like, Hey, I want to get my piece clean. Cause it's going to rent you in the hundreds. Um, but there is a big market for these heady pieces and reselling them and, uh, and whatnot. Yeah. Um, we're almost heading to an hour. I wanted to uh, ask you uh, any questions. What are your plans? What are you looking to do next? Maybe something you could share with us and where can people find you? Yeah, cool. Um, the next move is, so we've uh, in Ontario entered into another lockdown. So uh, my lounge stuff is completely on the back burner. So I'm gonna be focusing really heavily on the, on the cleaning uh what i want to do right away is get uh my rosin press up and running and start to offer that service on the side the nice that thing sounds about easy when you say it it sounds so easy what are what's okay you're trying to press rosin or just trying to make rosin what's the process in canada is it really simple you just get a machine and you start pressing or are you obviously legal stuff on the side or what how do you go through i don't the care if it's illegal um <laughs> uh there's nothing illegal with pressing rosin you're not using a solvent you're not using anything it's just heat and pressure mm -hmm. so uh i have a press and um the nice thing about this ultrasonic machine which was uh one of the things that really helps in the lounge um is it's hands off right i'm not mm -hmm. actually shaking anything i just put it in the machine for 10 minutes and i walk away right so while it's in the machine they're cleaning i can offer services on the side right and if people have flour again a lot of people grew their own weed this year in canada it was huge when the lockdown happened in march what were you going to do other than plant seeds right yeah so a lot of people grew weed and a lot of people gonna have more weed than they've ever had before and i, I think that there's going to be a demand for trying to play around with that weed whether it be turning it into edibles or turn it into this turn it into that I'm just trying to think of like what uh, I could do as a value add. And I think the rosin pressing is, is pretty new to a lot of people and um, presents a lot of fun. Um, but 
other than that, it's really going to be just trying to lock down these these repeat customers. I'm going to make a strong push on. So my strategy before on Instagram was to try to reach as many people as possible. Whereas like now that I have the time again, I'm really going to focus on watching Instagram and looking for those accounts of people who are clearly into cannabis, clearly a big part of their life. They might be sharing about it, posting their own reviews. And what I do is I always look for dirty bongs, right? And if their piece (laughs) looks really dirty, I'll just throw a comment in there like, wow, great review, really interesting, but, you know, might be a little nicer with a clean piece or that that thing doesn't look like, you know, like it's in its uh, best shape or whatever. And um, even if that doesn't attract that one person I commented on, if people are going to their account, follow weed reviews and they see that, they might go, oh, I have a dirty bong, right? And kind of that grassroots because they won't let me promote. And Mm -hmm. I think that my hat... And I think hashtags in the cannabis industry seem to be risky. Yep. Right. Just associating yourself with anything. My agency, my agency Instagram got shadow banned. Um, and in the funniest thing it was, I was in uh, automated uh, posts and they were nothing related to cannabis just because my name Cannabetic and I use a few tags, hemp cannabis. Yeah. Uh, they were all design related posts. Every single one. If you go on my Instagram, there's sure. nothing, there's no cannabis at all. I mean, it's full ancillary yeah. service, right? And it started, my views were like very organic. I was getting 20 to 30. And then uh, once I started going on the run of automating things, I saw that my stories kind of went down and even the reach went down too. And I have literal proof where it was three weeks before versus like two weeks after doing something. It's just complete drop, which is crazy. Yeah. So yeah, by that same token, I'm really going to avoid putting... I don't even know what the, uh, I'm not a marketing expert. I don't know what the word is, but just outward marketing mm-hmm. uh, uh, of what I do and just really focus on just sliding in the DMS and just letting the people who should know about this know. Cause one thing that frustrates me too, is like, I, I get, I get hit up. I, I get like a thousand views a month for the word peace mm-hmm. on Google. And it's like, nobody's looking for me when they look up peace, right? And it's like, and and I know that's just one metric or whatever, but like that just gets my brain thinking about like, what is my account being tied into? And why am I getting shadow banned? And like, it's the most frustrating thing in the world. Like I experienced it when I was in wine. Like a lot of people in this cannabis industry try to act like, oh, this is happening to us, right? But it used to happen in wine too, where like you couldn't promote anything and you'd get banned for like, you know, giving a review of a wine or whatever. Uh, but it just wasn't as extreme. Like they weren't deleting accounts. Like I have a friend who's an influencer and it's his livelihood. They deleted his account this week. They just upright deleted it. And my lounge's account got deleted during the lockdown. It's like everything working. We had 7,000 followers of dedicated followers. And then they just take them away from you. It's like, okay, well, now we can't reach the people we're supposed to reach when we're reopening. Um, yeah, backup accounts are clutch. Learning that. <laughs> um, I want to talk about uh, where can people find you? Um... Sorry, to, to find me. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, our, all of our socials are clean peace. Uh, C-L-E-A-N-P-I-E-C-E, Clean Peace 416. Um, and our website is cleanpeace416.com. Um, yeah, sliding in the Instagram DMs is probably the best way to reach me quickly. Uh, emailing us, cleanpeace416 at gmail.com. I try to keep everything just cleanpeace416 until we start to get banned on the social accounts and <laughs> Then I try to make sense of the 2,500 business cards and posters that I printed out with the, (laughs) you know, so frustrating, but um, yeah, that's the best way. Bam. Thanks for the talk, Anthony. Yeah. Thank you, man.